since yeah. we're getting down to the end of the semester. Yeah. We were going to talk about that. That's a good, good topic. <laughs> it's good. So, yes. Yes, you guys want to talk about all these questions. Okay. So, first of all, we'll just um, um, walk through this step by step. So, um,
kind of a combination, kind of getting the main, the main points. And as always happens this time of the semester, I'm like, where did all the weeks go? I need more lectures. So this will be um, kind of getting main topics and what I'll do, like when we start getting down to the line like this and we're rushing through a lot of information, um, I'm planning to give you guys some handouts. Like this is my, my lecture overview. So I'll copy these and pass them out in lecture. So it'll make it hopefully a little bit um, easier. We can get through the information a little bit um, more efficiently. Yeah. What handout did you say? Look at for articles Oh, in the um, that multi-page handout that had the bacteria five replication. Yeah. I think if you look in the very back, there's this dynamite article on antibiotic resistance. So make sure you guys that um, do, you know, read the article and then if, at the end they've included some questions that are very, very good questions. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what else? Oh, and then, um, okay, okay, and so whatever we cover through next Tuesday would be fair game on the lecture exam three. Okay. And then what's so scary is like it's just absolutely bonkers. Um, we only have um, then, yeah, see this is what threw me. I thought we were going to have two weeks between the last lecture exam and the final, but there's only like one week. And I think you guys only get one lecture. Yeah. So, in that lecture, uh, this is going to be silly, silly, silly. In that last lecture, we're going to be um, looking at host defenses, and obviously it'll have to be really um, condensed. And I think what I'm going to do is try to create like a little host defenses um, work uh, handout for you, mm -hmm. where it'll have the concept at the top, and then it'll have, these are likely to see questions on the bottom. So that you guys will really know what I'm going to ask you, okay? And again, that's um, that's a strategy I use when we get to the end of the course like this, and we're running out of time. And it's like these concepts are important, but I also know that you guys need to be really efficient studying. So that's probably how we'll tackle um, the um, post defenses. So it'll be really, really light on non-specific defenses, and then we will spend more time on antibodies. Um, and antibody-mediated uh, uh, defenses. Okay. All right, so Jeremy, did that help? Yeah. yeah, okay. All right, yeah. And then the final, oh my goodness, the final is, you guys have it so hard, I feel so bad for you. It's the first day. It's crazy. Like, we have our last lecture Tuesday, and then you guys have your final that Thursday. So that is craziness. Um, so it's Thursday, May 10th, and it is a comprehensive final. It's two hours, so it goes 10 a, excuse me, 8 a.m., you guys, apologies. So your final is Thursday, May 10th, the first day of finals. It starts at 8 a.m., it goes to 10 a.m., and what it would, um, what it would cover is, um, it is a comprehensive final. Um, so it's going to be, I'm guessing, around 130, around 130 questions. They're all Scantron questions. There's no, um, there's no mouse. Um, and so um, around 100, 110 of them are comprehensive, covers the whole course. And then the remaining few questions will focus on the, the last topic on post defenses. Okay, and it does include a um, case study where you guys discover a brand new microbe. And I give you descriptions, and then you answer questions based on the descriptions that I give you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they don't be an honor, like, the first Well, the case study, the way, I think, and I can't remember, the case study, I think, is around maybe 30 or 40 questions. Um, it weaves together a lot of basic microbiology information, so I can't guarantee you that in the case study, everything's gonna be exactly in the same order we presented it in lecture. Um, but then the, the second part of the comprehensive portion, it is pretty much in order of how the information was presented during the course, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and people have asked, is there a study guide for the final exam, and there's not. You know, some folks have used the old study guides, um, usually what I try to do is emphasize topics that were on previous exams. 
um, but it's not necessarily a cut and paste from previous exams, right? Um, but my philosophy in tackling that final is if you were to go out and say apply for a job that required you to have had a microbiology course, what I try to do in the final is make it topics that an employer or say you were to um, go on to do more work in microbiology, it, um, it's the kind of information an employer should expect that you would know or be information that um, your next professors in microbiology would presume you would know haven't taken an introductory microbiology course. Okay, so, okay. So, um, but I also want to let you guys know that very, 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 very rarely does a final exam cause a, a student to fall from one grade to another unless they're right on the borderline. Um, but folks, for example, that have strong Bs, Usually, they, they have a strong A on the final. Folks that have strong A's in the course, they usually have a strong A on the final. And as an instructor, that makes me feel good. That makes me feel like the final is fair, right? Um, if you are, however, right on the borderline, a really strong performance on the final exam can guarantee that next higher grade. But then, I, I know this is our nightmare, right? We just wait for fly awake at night. They go, oh, no, no. But the bad news is, if you are on the borderline, if you don't do very well in the final, it, it certainly can bring you down to that lower grade that you don't want, right? So, um, yeah. And I know that's not very helpful. And that might cause insomnia or something. But just, just, you know, like, if you're happy with where you're at right now in the course, just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And nine times out of ten, you're going to, you know, you'll have that same performance on the final. Okay. Oh, gosh. So, we were talking about um, viruses. And you, I so apologize, you guys. I have three separate virus lectures going on in three separate classes. And so consequently, I always forget where I am in which lecture. So can you all help me out with um, uh, giving me a hint where we left off last time with our DNA viruses? Had we finished um, the fox virus family? Have we gone through cow pox and monkey pox? Does that ring a bell? That rings a bell? Okay. Had we introduced herpes viruses? Herpes who are like diamonds because diamonds are forever. Okay, so is this, do you think, where we left off with herpes viruses? Is it smallpox? Yeah. Smallpox. Okay. Okay, so have, have we gotten to cowpox? No. Okay, have we gotten to the smallpox vaccine? No. Oh, we're going to Okay, okay, all right. We were talking about you know, smallpox.
So Jim took that knowledge and decided to run an experiment, and this is that kind of, well, not kind of, unethical experiment. He asked his gardener, um, I have this smallpox uh, protection experiment I want to run. Can I use your son? <laughs> it's like the gardener's like, oh, okay, boss. So here's the son, the gardener's son, he had inoculated with fluid from the cowpox vesicle on the milkweed ceremonies. So here's Jenner. He, he harvested fluid and then scraped it in the arm of this little boy. And you can see the boy is absolutely delighted that he's part of this experiment. <laughs> <laughs> probably his dad afterwards. So that part wasn't bad, right? Because everybody knew the cowpox wouldn't kill you. But the next part of the experiment was very unethical. What Jenner next did was that he waited and then he harvested fluid from one of his smallpox patients and he purposely inoculated the little boy. And the idea was to see if the cowpox material somehow had protected the little boy against the smallpox. And luckily it did. The little boy did get smallpox. But you know, that's totally unethical to use human subjects to, to run challenge experiments like that. And then what made it worse for the little boy was that when Jenner reported this work, you know, he, Jenner honestly wanted to find a way to protect people against smallpox. So he published his work, and part of science you guys know is you have, your experiments have to be repeated to be believed, right? So everybody flocked to Jenner and says, show us, show us again. So this poor little boy got inoculated, inoculated, and inoculated over and over again um, with smallpox material, and he never got sick. Well, there were still many folks that doubted this procedure, and so, again, part of science is you can't have just one test subject, right? You have to have lots and lots. So this is another unethical part. Um, so Jenner ended up turning to orphanages and workhouses for the poor and um, got more test subjects, you know? So again, not very ethical, but luckily, when he repeated this procedure of inoculating these folks with cowpox material and then challenging later with smallpox, um, none of them developed smallpox. So again, incredibly unethical, but luckily it worked. And um, eventually then, Jenner's use of cowpox became accepted and became the, um, the most popular way of, of vaccinating people against smallpox. And indeed, my understanding is it was Louis Pasteur that um, actually first coined the term vaccination in honor of Jenner's work with cowpox and vaccination coming from vodka for, for cow, right? Okay. Now, just so we know, um, the smallpox um, as a disease in the wild was eradicated by a vaccination campaign by the World Health Organization in the late 1970s. Um, during their vaccination campaign, so I'll call this the so-called modern smallpox vaccine, It was a modified live virus, meaning that it actually invaded the human cells and replicated and it would cause these fluid-filled um, vesicles that were chock full of the vaccine virus. But just so if you guys run into microbiologists and want to split hairs, um, officially the smallpox vaccine virus is, is officially not cowpox virus now, it's called the vaccinia virus. Now, in many microbiology textbooks, they say that the smallpox vaccine virus is cowpox. And again, you know, this is just where you can get into an argument with microbiologists. It turns out when uh, the Centers for Disease Control, which is our national disease prevention um, uh, government center, when they did DNA sequence of actual wild cowpox virus out in the wild and they compared it to the vaccinia virus, there's actually significant DNA differences, and they say they really can't exactly figure out what happened, but I mean, I'm just a simpleton, right? My thought is they have um, used cowpox over and over and over again to make these vaccines. They've been passing it in cattle, in calves. They actually would grow it in calves, harvest it, and then process it to make the um, smallpox vaccine. My thought is it's probably just accumulated mutations over the, you know, almost hundreds of years. But again, if on a, a fill-in question, you guys, if I asked you what is the virus that's used in the so-called modern smallpox virus, if you put cowpox, I'd give you credit. But just be aware, some, some folks might say, no, no, it's not just the virus. Okay, but, okay, that's just that. Now, the problem is, um, um, 
oh, but, but the, we'll back up here and just try to address why is it that this um, um, vaccine virus, initially the cowpox virus, how come it can protect you against smallpox? Well, they are close cousins in the same pox virus family. And it turns out the surface proteins um, that trigger antibody production, if you get infected with cowpox virus or vaccinia virus, your body responds by making antibodies that will attach to the surface uh, proteins of the um, cowpox virus or vaccinia virus. And those antibodies block attachment of the virus to our cells. They're neutralizing antibodies, right? So they're protective. Well, luckily, very luckily, the smallpox virus, the variola virus, the proteins on its surface are similar enough to the proteins on cowpox and vaccine virus that those antibodies against the uh, vaccine virus will also bind to the surface of the smallpox virus. So we get this cross-reactive immunity, uh, immunity against one pathogen also provides protection against a closely related pathogen, and that's why this works. Now, here's the problem, though, you guys, with this vaccine. And this, this is a concept we really, this is like an important concept we really want to, uh, we, we want to really remember this. Okay, so the, um, you guys remember when we were talking about the polio vaccines and we said there was a Sabin live attenuated polio vaccine. It was a live, like, weakened low virulence polio mm -hmm. virus. And what did we say was the problem with that one? Yes, yeah, sometimes the virus would revert to virulence, right, and actually cause polio. Okay, well, this is another problem um, with, the, with live virus vaccines. And that is, this isn't where the smallpox vaccine, the vaccine virus, is reverted to virulence. This is an example of when you inoculate the vaccine virus into somebody whose immune system is defective or lowered, the host immune system can't control replication of that vaccine virus. And this is heartbreaking to you guys. This is a picture of a little baby that received the smallpox vaccine, the vaccine virus, and they didn't know this little baby had a, a, a defect in the baby's immune system. So this, okay, here's, here's like normal uh, vaccine reaction where the vaccine virus has invaded cells, it's replicating, it's causing lysis, and we have the food filled um, pox here with the vaccine virus, but eventually the body is able to um, kill the cells that are infected and you get, you, uh, you stop replication of that vaccine virus. And this poor little baby, because the immune system was defective, the vaccine virus just started replicating in an uncontrolled fashion. And it's heartbreaking, guys, this little baby died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know, oh, I know, <laughs> oh my gosh. So, so, and, and this is important because um, when smallpox was eradicated from the wild, right? That was great. No, no longer any need to vaccinate people against smallpox, right? And that's actually good because we don't want things like this happening. But then, you know, sadly, in 2001, when we had the crazy anthrax and the spores being sent through the mail and everything, everyone got so worried and they go, wow, we're really vulnerable to attack biolog biological warfare. <laughs> agents such as smallpox, maybe we should start vaccinating everybody against smallpox again. But again, folks, the general you know, conclusion was it's not worth it because um, you could, just like this little baby, maybe you'd be vaccinating kids that have immune disorders and you're not aware of, you have horrible reactions like this. They also discovered that folks that had cardiovascular disease often had complications from the vaccine virus. Um, People with um, some types of perhaps autoimmune associated disorders like psoriasis, they too could have adverse reactions to the vaccine virus. So the, the uh, oh, and another concern was, so some people said, well then we should only vaccinate like first responders and people that work in hospitals, right? But here's the thing, you guys, let's say you're working in a hospital and you're fine, you got vaccinated, right? But are you shedding vaccine virus for a while after you're vaccinated? Yes, you are. And, and who are many of your patients going to be? People that are immunocompromised, right? So that's a huge concern if you vaccinate medical personnel, first responders that might be working with patients who are immunocompromised. 
The medical personnel can act as a source of vaccinia virus for the people that are immunocompromised. So um, I believe, and you guys help me out here, I believe in the military, you still get vaccinated against smallpox. Is that, is that right? Any, anybody know for sure? Because again, I think the concern of biological um, warfare agents, right? But generally, unless you're at like really high risk, we still don't vaccinate against smallpox as far as I'm aware of. Okay, so you've got to remember this, you guys, with those attenuated live viruses um, or, you know, like um, uh, uh, look-alike viruses, if they are live and they can cause infections, be careful that you don't inoculate people that are immunocompromised with them. Now, this is something, just some features of um, smallpox that permitted, some of the features of smallpox that permitted its eradication, because we always want to think, well, why can't we, for example, eradicate polio? Why can't we eradicate measles? Why can't we eradicate a lot of these infectious diseases? So these are some of the um, uh, uh, factors that are um, um, described as contributing to the eradication of smallpox for the wild. So there was an inexpensive, relatively safe, relatively safe, stable vaccine available to um, provide immunization. This is so important, you guys. Smallpox is human specific. There's no um, uh, animal reservoirs. And because it's an envelope virus, it doesn't remain infectious in the environment for long. So humans are the only reservoir, and that is very important. These two kind of go together. Um, there are, if you are infected, there's going to be severe, obvious signs and symptoms that enable quick diagnosis. And this was very important quarantine. So as soon as you, it was obvious that you had smallpox in these eradication campaigns, you were not allowed to leave your house so that you wouldn't spread the smallpox virus to other people. You shed it initially in respiratory secretions. It's not always just like skin to skin contact or actually shedding it for, from respiratory secretions. And again, the related, there are no asymptomatic cases, meaning people never become infected and aren't aware of it or never develop signs or symptoms. So again, that's crucial because it permits you to have an effective quarantine. And so what they would do is when there were cases of smallpox, they would quarantine the individuals and they'd start doing what's called ring vaccination. They'd start from a distance from where the outbreak was and they'd start vaccinating from the outside in, working inwards. So that's called ring vaccination. And again, this is really important since it's an envelope virus, it's, it's, um, it has to be spread by close contact between an infected person and a susceptible person. So again, animals won't act as reservoirs, the environment doesn't act as a reservoir. And so we want to be thinking of these things um, when we think of the other infectious diseases we've described and um, those that might, um, maybe there is a good chance that we can eradicate them from the wild or ones, for example, that have non-human animal reservoirs or just reservoirs of the environment, those are going to be a lot tougher to eradicate because you can never get rid of the pathogen in the environment. The World Health Organization is, uh, the next disease on its list is the polio virus, but remember you guys, polio is a naked virus, so that means the environment can act as a reservoir, okay, so that polio might be a lot harder to eradicate, and they definitely are having troubles eradicating it. Now, this is just to um, let, let us um, kind of explore some of these other related pox viruses. You remember the cowpox virus that the milkmaid had? Well, cowpox is misleading. Cowpox virus, the natural reservoir, are rodents. They're rodents. Cows are just accidental hosts. They develop these lesions, and we interact more with cows than we do with wild rodents. But this is just an example that cowpox is still out there in the wild. This was a little girl from Denmark, Scandinavia, I can't remember. Um, on the way home from school, she saw a sick rodent by the roadside, brought it home to nurse it. <laughs> yeah, and ended up with transmission of cowpox virus from the rodent to the girl. Now, it might be, if that rodent was actually ill with the cowpox, it might be it was an unusually virulent strain. And, and it would explain why her infection was so severe. You know, this is really scary, the eye infections. Or maybe her immune system, maybe she, maybe genetically there's something a little bit defective with her immune system. She did die, so that's good. But we can see she had, you know, pretty widespread uh, uh, cowpox infection. And this is another huge concern, you guys. This is an emerging infectious disease called monkeypox. 
And just as cowpox is misleading, monkeypox, the name is misleading, because monkeypox, the natural reservoir, are also rodents. So monkeypox is endemic, meaning it's always present in parts of Africa. Okay, and um, this, 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 I bring the story up because we as humans are pretty silly. Um, here we are so worried about the spread of infectious diseases. And then we still permit these crazy um, uh, uh, processes to occur. And the crazy process that um, occurred is that um, people were allowed to import um, rodents from Africa into the United States as exotic pets. And I'm like, oh, rodents. give me a break. I know, truly, you know, rodents are such wonderful reservoirs for all kinds of pathogens that potentially can jump to humans. So a few years ago, one of these exotic pet importers Im imported some um, rodents from Africa, <laughs> giant Gambian rats. Giant oh. Gambian rats, right? Oh, wow. And, you know, for the rich and famous, they have, you know, poodles are not good enough for them. They have that much <laughs> Gambian rat. So when these um, rodents were imported, it turned out some of them were infected with monkeypox, right? And they were co-housed, housed together with native North American animals, uh, prairie dogs. Now, I think it's illegal here in California to have prairie dogs as pets, but apparently um, in the Midwest and back east, they're the cats meow. They're the cool pet, right? Well, as you might guess, the mon monkeypox virus jumped from the Gambian rats into the prairie dogs. The prairie dogs were shipped to pet stores, were bought by, uh, by people. And so then the monkeypox virus jumped from the infected prairie dogs to the people. So there was an outbreak where a family got infected, the, the veterinarian, the vet technician got infected with monkeypox. And the huge concern was when word spread that these pet prairie dogs were carrying a viral disease, that people would release their pet prairie dogs into the wild, not wanting to hurt them or kill them, and that then the uh, monkeypox virus would spread to our native prairie dogs, and then we would become an, um, um, endemic for monkeypox. Now, why is this a problem? Okay, so kind of skipped an important part of the story. Monkeypox, again, it's in the same uh, family as smallpox. As long as we had worldwide vaccination going on against smallpox, people had cross-protective immunity against monkeypox. When we stop vaccinating against smallpox, then we start seeing some really serious cases of monkeypox in Africa. Just like with cowpox, if your immune system is robust, you know, working well, you know, you might get pretty sick, but usually to get over monkeypox, it's not usually lethal. But if your immune system is defective, it can kill you, right? And in some parts of Africa where there's, you know, just heartbreaking rates of HIV AIDS, monkeypox, if, you, if you're suffering from AIDS, monkeypox can kill you, right? So that's the heartbreak in, in Africa. And then, of course, a huge concern was we can have the same situation here in the United States by importing monkeypox if it became established in our wild rodent population then we would have the same issues of transmission to people in our community who are immunocompromised. So we could you know, be introducing one more pathogen that could kill people that have AIDS, or undergoing cancer therapy, or transplant recipients, or on long-term steroid therapy for autoimmune disease or chronic um, inflammatory disease. Right, so um, luckily, I think the, the public health world thinks we dodged that bullet. You know, it, they don't think monkeypox got into our, our native rodents. But can you guys believe we do things like that? I mean, we have these great movies about these contagious, you know, organisms, and then we do silly things like import exotic rodents from any part of the world. You know, when you import rodents, you're importing trouble, right? Because they're wonderful reservoirs for all kinds of microbes that can make the jump into humans. And I'm like, I can't believe we allowed that to happen. That is just silliness. Okay, so I think that's the end of our pox virus family. And now we're going to move on to the herpes viruses. Now, herpes viruses that are like diamonds because diamonds are forever, according to Dr. Robert Chang. I just cracked up when he said that. So um, herpes comes from the Greek to creep, and it might have to do with how the lesions spread. Um, the viruses invade cells, they replicate, they invade the neighboring cells, so you get these like spreading lesions. 
And there are so many different herpes viruses, you guys. I couldn't believe it, how many herpes viruses there are. We're just going to talk about a few. Now, um, if you're being politically correct, you should refer the herpes viruses by number according to the, um, the order that they were discovered. But many of the herpes viruses have older kind of traditional names. And very often I end up using the older traditional name, but I'll try to remember when, when I can to give you the number. So um, these herpes viruses that infect humans, the, the, the politically correct way to refer to them is by human herpes viruses, and then you give the number. So HHV, human herpes virus 1 and 2, these are the first ones discovered. Um, these are the so-called herpes simplex viruses, and th these are the first we'll, dis we'll discuss. Then we'll talk about the varicella zoster virus. This is a so-called chickenpox shingles viruses. This always confuses me, you guys, because since you get these skin lesions, uh, fluid-filled pustules, um, the traditional name is chickenpox, but these are not pox viruses. And that always, I always have to catch myself there. Remember, you guys, chickenpox are what? Herpes viruses. And consequently, if we're infected, we can be infected for life. Okay. And then the last one we'll talk about, you guys, is just very briefly, epstein bar virus. We're not going to talk about cytomegalovirus virus because we're just running out of time. Okay, so herpes virus structure, um, they're envelopes, so that's good news. They will not remain infectious in the environment for long. They have a polyhedral capsule, the protein, um, Excuse me, not capsule. Oh, that was just that. No, don't say capsule. They have a polyhedral capsid, okay, protein code, and inside they have DNA. Um, so they they uh, they have proteins in the envelope that bind to our host cell surface receptors. That permits entry to the capsid. The capsid is disassembled, and then the DNA makes its way. The DNA makes its way into our nucleus. So these viruses replicate in our nucleus. Now, this is really cool to me. I guess it's kind of nerdy. But um, the way they acquire this envelope, this envelope is not our cytoplasmic membrane. Who do you think this envelope is made from? Our nuclear membrane. Isn't that wild? Oh, that's so cool. No, not, I mean, they have heard. That part's not cool. Okay. So they bud through the nucleus, and then they're released either be an exocytosis or probably more commonly by lysis. And this is what caused the really painful tissue destruction for those of you that have your diamond-like herpes, you know how painful these lesions are. And I have herpes and I know how painful these lesions are. And the, the kind of the hallmark of the herpes virus family uh, is their ability to establish latent infections. And latent infections are when we are infected with a pathogen, but the pathogen is not actively replicating. So during these quiet periods, we don't think we're infected anymore. Like right now, I've got herpes hanging out here in my trigeminal ganglion. I feel fine. But whenever I go through periods of stress, maybe um, not eating, not sleeping, and women, the menstrual cycle, the ebb and flow of hormones can act as triggers. If you get sick, if you become um, immunosuppressed, old age, oh my gosh, it goes on and on. These are triggers to reactivate the virus. And when the virus is reactivating, it starts to replicate again, and we'll have a whole new wonderful bout of clinical signs and symptoms. Okay, so we'll, like, we'll, we'll explore this concept of latency a little bit more. Okay, so these, it's these latent infections that makes herpes like diamonds, because once we have them, we have them forever. Um, reactivation, just some of the stresses here. And this, this third point here, you guys, is really important. Um, it's believed that some of, the, some of the herpes viruses causing these latent infections, they might actually insert their DNA into our chromosomes. And depending on where they insert their DNA and what kind of activity that herpes DNA sequence has, it may cause some of our cells to no longer be able to control cell division. And therefore, some herpes viruses may increase our chance of cancers. So, for example, in folks that are severely immunocompromised, our HIV AIDS um, patients, um, it's, it's now known that those folks that are suffering from AIDS are at high risk for a very unusual cancer known as Kaposi sarcoma. This is a cancer of the endothelial cells of, for example, the uh, blood vessels. Here we see the skin of an AIDS patient suffering from Kaposi sarcoma. 
And what's been discovered is um, the, uh, the actual pathogen that triggers the cancer is a herpes virus, human herpes virus type B. And again, it might be because it's inserting into the chromosome and um, destroying the ability of the endothelial cells to control uh, cell replication. And then when we talk about the Epstein-Barr virus, human herpes virus type 4, we're going to see that it too is associated with increased risk for um, a couple of types of camper, cancer, Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal cancer. Okay, so these latent viruses that potentially can insert their DNA into our cells, not good. So let's talk about um, the, the two herpes viruses that were first discovered, the so-called um, herpes simplex viruses, human herpes virus type 1 and 2. Now, if um, human herpes virus type 1 and 2 read textbooks, they would know that human herpes virus type 1 traditionally causes infections above the belt, so mouth, eyes, fingers, right? And human herpes virus type 2 causes infections below the belt, meaning the genital tract. But you guys, do viruses read textbooks? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is so important for us to remember. It's so important for us to remember that human herpes virus type 2 can also cause infections of the mouth, and that human herpes virus type 1 can cause infections of the genital tract. So remember, you guys, for a human herpes virus, um, mucous membrane is a mucous membrane. They're equal opportunity, equal cell opportunity viruses, and that is so important. Um, and we, we maybe mentioned already, you guys, there's um, a total misunderstanding amongst a lot of young people that oral sex is safe sex. Because they think, okay, you can't get, you can't get pregnant, right? And a lot of young people think that oral sex, you won't get infected with genital pathogens. Are they wrong? Oh my goodness, are they wrong. So this is what we want to spread to our patients, our friends, our families. Remember, these genital pathogens equal opportunity, right? We, we, will, we will infect any mucous membrane. Okay, so that's really important for us to remember. And the other thing that's really important for us to remember is that we can be shedding herpes without clinical signs and symptoms. A real important study was completed last year where they asked folks that they knew had genital herpes to um, every few weeks take a genital swab, send it in to be assayed for herpes virus, and to include um, a little description if they felt like they were having an outbreak, if they had clinical signs and symptoms. And the results of the study were that in 10% of the swabs, the swabs were positive for herpes, but the person was not experiencing clinical signs and symptoms. So this is something that always comes up. It's like, could we be, like, can I be shedding herpes viruses and not know it? And the answer is yes. And this becomes really important with genital herpes. If we know we're infected, we, we really need to make sure we're protecting our partners, right? Because we might be shedding and not even know it. So once infected, just be, you know, we want to be careful. You know, knowledge is power, you guys. So um, if you're infected, just be aware you might be shedding at times when you don't have clinical signs and symptoms. Okay, so what happens, um, we'll talk about first infections and then what happens. So um, we'll use um, oral herpes first. So what happens is when we first become infected, the virus, um, usually infects epithelial cells of the mucous membranes or the skin around the lips. In some cases, in really severe primary, first time cases, you can get lesions throughout your mouth. You can have um, herpes pharyngitis. I mean, it can be bad. That's what, hap that's what happened to me when I got it. I was in college, and I think because I got infected when I was in college, I had a really strong immune system. I was sicker than a dog. I had a fever. I felt like I was gonna die. I went to the student health center and the doctor steps up with his tongue depressor and he says, say on, he looks in my mouth and he takes a step back. I was like, oh God, I'm gonna die. And, I was like, <laughs> and he's like, you, you guys, um, I remember this. He says, it's herpes, but don't worry, it's not the bad kind. And I'm kind of like, I was so naive. I didn't, you know, what's the bad kind? You know, it's like, I don't know if he, and I still don't know what he meant. Did he mean I didn't have genital herpes? I don't know. But, um, so I think because I got infected when I was older, I had such a strong immune system, uh, immune response. That's probably what was making me so sick, I think, is it was my immune response was so strong and robust. Well, what happens is after we're first infected, the virus is replicating the epithelial cells, they cause lysis, lots of pain. You, 
you might feel really sick. But then what they do, the viruses invade your sensory neurons, and they travel up the axons of your sensory neurons. And what they'll do then is they'll um, reach the neuron cell body where the nucleus is, and that's where they'll just wait in this latent stage, not replicating, they're just hanging out. But again, once infected, whenever you go through any of those triggers, you'll reactivate the virus. The virus can travel back down the axons, reinvade the epithelial cells at the ends of the sensory, where the sensory neurons innervate, um, cause lysis of those epithelial cells. So you have reactivation. You have a new bout of clinical signs and symptoms. Now, what's really troublesome here, you guys, is that, and you guys in AMP help me out here because my AMP is so bad. But, um, okay, so the trigeminal ganglion up here, um, my understanding is, if, since I'm infected up here, in theory, if my virus activates, it might not travel back down my maxillary branch here. In theory, you could take the ophthalmic branch, and in theory, I could have reactivation of herpes infection in my eye. So I could end up with ocular or ophthalmic herpes, and I never knew this is a, a serious cause of blindness, right? And another thing that could cause um, damage to my eyes, this is really bad, you guys, I know. Don't do what I do. I wear hard contact lenses, and if you have hard contact lenses, you get dirt in your eye, it's really, really painful. And if you're out and about, you know, you don't have a sink and all your solutions. So what I've done ever since I've had these lenses, I'll pop them out of my eye and pop them in my mouth. And again, you guys, oh my God, is that stupid or what? Because here I could be shedding, right? And maybe I've got a little, you know, a little scratch on my cornea. So I'm gonna put my contact lens in my mouth where I could be shedding herpes and then pop it back into my eye. That is the most stupid thing I've ever heard. So just don't do what your microbiology instructor does, okay? All right. <laughs> and then another, another way that we could become infected, this is an occupational risk for those of you going into dentistry, those of you that are gonna be going into obstetrics or gynecology, those of you in respiratory therapy, is that um, if you're working with a patient that's shedding either uh, oral herpes or genital herpes, and you have a little damage to your skin, you potentially can become infected with the herpes on um, the uh, skin of your fingers and develop a primary infection. The herpes invades, the sensory neurons travel back up here, are going to hang out in your brachial ganglia. And then again, when you undergo triggers, reactivation, they come back down here, they reinvade the epithelial cells of your fingertips, and then you can act as a source of herpes for your patients. So that's a kind of occupational hazard there. Okay. With the genital tract, same story over and over again. Initial, initial infection of the epithelial cells of skin or mucous membranes, invasion of the sensory neurons, then the virus remains latent in the sacral ganglia, and again, trigger, reactivation comes back down, and we have new rounds of clinical signs and symptoms. Okay, so this is some of the, just the classic uh, lesions that, that we see.